It is reasonably certain that man was originally made to live and exercise in the open air, bathe in rivers, and expose his body to the healthful action of the sun without even the protection of clothing. So, hey! <laughs> so, so this brings us to the idea of a mismatch, right? A mismatch between the way humans were quote unquote designed to live and the modern world. So the problem is modern civilization. Specifically the problems of uh, tobacco, alcohol, overconsumption, uh, patent drugs, which were the forerunner, forerunners to prescription drugs, and ill-fitting clothing. Now, it was believed that these problems were leading to degeneration or decline of both individuals and the species as a whole. And here we can clearly see the influence of Darwin's new theory of evolution in this image from 1904. So the goal of this physical culture movement was to create ideal men and women, ideal men and women who were strong and healthy in comparison to the modern Americans of 100, 100 years ago. So uh, on, on the right there of that image, we see this uh, woman squeezed into a corset and high heels. We see the classic skinny fat man. And we see this over-intellectualized child with glasses and a skull that's too big. Perhaps today he'd be holding a, a mobile device as opposed to a book. So again, he, here's this ideal. The physical culture movement was trying to create this ideal by mimicking hunter-gatherers and looking to the past. And if, if people followed that, they would look like Eugene Sandow on the right. This, this picture is from about 1900. So let's pretend for a moment that we want to join this physical culture movement. So what, what are some of the things we would do? Well, first we would eat natural foods. These things should sound familiar. Eat whole foods, avoid processed foods, drink some raw milk, maybe take some fish oil, right? The key point here is that for the first time really in the modern period, there's a scientific approach to nutrition as opposed to just eating what religion or tradition or culture dictated. This is an important difference. And it was believed that by eating a more natural diet, we could optimize health and cure disease. So ads like this were very common. We might also want to try some fasting, 24-hour fasting and multi-day fast were possible, or we could do some punctuated eating, right? And you could get your own little watch to guide you through the day. All you paleo entrepreneurs, take note. <laughs> Uh, rise early, exercise, first meal at 11, walk in the afternoon, second and last meal at 5, go to bed at 10, and you do the calculation, that's nine solid hours of sleep. We'd also want to take care of our intestinal health, maybe take some probiotics. Yogurt was especially popular 100 years ago, and this is a great image of good bacteria kicking the butt of bad bacteria, right? out of your stomach, out of your intestines. We'd want to do some full body strength training. We might try these groovy barbells. <laughs> and don't, don't be mistaken, some of these folks were ripped. We'd also want to do a lot of walking, maybe even some barefoot walking. This poem from 1859 is great. It says, other kinds of exercises are good, but walking's even better. And on, the, and on the right, we see what might be the first minimalist shoes. Right? Representatives from Vibrant, Vibrant, take note. Um, there were concerns about unnatural forms of exercise, like cycling, <laughs> leading to deformities. And I think this, in some ways, <laughs> echoes Jamie Scott's talk, talk yesterday. <clears throat> now, we might also want to join one of the new gyms that were springing up. And these gyms look remarkably similar to some of the boxes we see today. So we have rings and bars and free weights, or this cool gym in France, indoor track, bodyweight exercises, even some MMA action in the middle. <laughs> or maybe you're a do-it-yourselfer and you want to build your own home gym. So there's a, a simple model on the left, some adjustable bars, or something more complex on the right. This is 1906. So platform, adjustable squat bar. 
And then once you got all ripped in your basement, you could try out for the physical culture exhibition, which I think could be called the first CrossFit Games, held in 1905 in Madison Square Garden. There were 17 different events, lots of walking and jumping, uh, sorry, running and jumping, but there were also things like the deadlift, weighted carry, and rope climb. This is a great rare photo from this period. Um, this is the competition arena, M Madison Square Garden, and based on the N-shaped structure in the middle, it looks like it was a hell of a rope climb. Okay, after the competition, maybe we want to experiment with some cold exposure. So it was widely believed that um, ice baths uh, helped it, um, promote recovery and increase longevity. And in fact, the publisher Bernard, Bernard McFadden founded the first polar bear club in the United States in 1903, which is still around today, Coney Island. Um, also, like today, women were very much a part of this movement. So we have the women's strength training. There was an emphasis on natural childbirth, breastfeeding, and dress reform. And I think these images are really remarkable. So women with, women with dumbbells, women doing body weight exercises, and women on rings. Even some Olympic lifting. And, child, and children weren't forgot, forgotten either. All right, so we have children with dumbbells, uh, children doing some posing there, and then on the right, what might be best described as mobility work. <laughs> All right, and just like today, there was a, a criticism of conventional medicine, so doctors were seen as pill pushers who just treated symptoms. And instead, physical culturists, culturalists wanted an emphasis on preventative medicine. And we can see this image on, on the right, I think, is really, really great. So the fences represent present preventative medicine. So rather than building fences, we let people fall off the health cliff, and then we rush them to the hospital, rather than uh, taking care of them ahead of time. Uh, so take this drug industry, right? Um, there was also criticism of patent drugs. Again, these are the forerunners to, to uh, prescription drugs today. Um, they came under fire, especially because they were often marketed, sounds familiar, marketed to the lower classes. Okay, this brings me to the physical culture joke of the day. Right? I saw this several times in my research. What does MD stand for? More dollars. <laughs> Okay, the physical culture movement was also powered by new media, but the new media of 100 years ago were different. So we have photography, film, and this was also the golden age of newspapers and magazines. We can think of William Randolph Hearst here. So I have a short 20 second video clip that I'd like to show from 1900 that, that represents this, this use of new media. Could be right off YouTube. Catch that back foot? <laughs> okay. So um, out of this publishing frenzy came a number of bestsellers. And, and the circulation of, for some of these magazines are really quite incredible. Uh, the Physical Culture magazine was called Physical Culture, um, exceeded half a million monthly, uh, monthly subscribers. It was pretty remarkable in the 1920s. So half a million publication. Uh, and these books which were published 100 years ago are remarkable to the books, uh, paleo books we see today. So let's just look at chapter three and chapter five from this book from 1925. Water, uh, nature's natural solvent, flushing the system, a mistaken idea, right? And five, why the calorie theory is misleading. Calories do not indicate real food values. Wow, I and mean, this could come from one of the presentations today. Um, and like today, there were hundreds of success stories. 
And I would argue these success stories benefited both, both the submitter and the publisher. We have here a man recovering from tuberculosis, 1909, a small child regaining his health, and of course the classic same pair of pa uh, trousers picture before and after, 1909. These are all from these physical culture magazines. Uh, finally here, in terms of similarities, there was an emphasis on outdoor exercise and sun exposure. And, and this quote from the middle um, could be pulled right out of the paleo solution or primal blueprint, right? To, explo to expose the entire body to the direct rays of the sun with all the clothing removed is very conducive to health. This is the best method of, of obtaining an adequate ration of vitamin D. Begin with a short exposure of 10 or 15 minutes and prolong the duration of the sun bath for an additional few minutes each day. I mean, this is sound, kind of sound rational advice you hear today. Uh, on the left, we have some pretty gnarly trail running. And on the right, um, we see a young girl enjoying nature in the nude, which brings me to the second part of my talk. <laughs> so differences between the physical culture movement and the paleo movement of today. So nudism was popular, right, or what was called naturism. Uh, wearing clothing was seen as a weakness, and um, the first nudist clubs appeared first in Europe and then later in the United States. And I don't have time to go into it today, but I would argue that this also influenced the artistic production at the period. Uh, here we have Matisse on the left and Gauguin on the right. Uh, with the exception of the presentation yesterday morning, there was much more of an emphasis on correct breathing and posture 100 years ago than there, than there is today. And there was a real emphasis on clean air, especially in these rapid industrializing cities right, in Northern Europe and the Northeast of the United States. So here we have goggles and a nose filter recommended for city living, especially for train travel, which could be quite dirty. Circulation is another difference. So there was, it was thought that brain work, and brain work means sitting behind a desk, led to poor circulation. And this is one of the origins of Swedish, Swedish, Swedish massage, um, and also the idea of, of um, you could rub yourself vigorously after a shower, increase circulation, and also what was called hydropathy. Hydropathy is the application of different amounts of water and different temperatures of water to the body, and that's what we see on the right there. So we don't talk so much about kind of, you know, are we lacking in, in circulation? Another difference or is, is there were some, uh, the food recommendations were not exactly the same as today. So there were many vegetarians who were physical culturalists. Some advocated raw foods and some embraced unadulterated whole wheat bread. And this might be more understandable when we realize that celiac disease, the connection between gluten and celiacs, wasn't made until the 1940s by a Dutch pediatrician. But what I find really amazing is that we're still having the same de debates as 100 years ago, right? So cooked food versus raw food, vegetarianism versus meat eating, and body weight exercises versus pumping iron. All, all the same debates. It was also more of an emphasis on mastication, right? <laughs> on chewing your food. Right? We just heard a presentation on this. Uh, Horace Fletcher popular, popularized this. He wrote a number of books, very, very popular. So popular, in fact, that he was able to buy a villa in Italy right? uh, from, from the books that he sold. And he said, look, you should chew your food until the point where there's no swallowing necessary. And this actually works. At lunch, you should, you should give it a try. If you chew enough, it just slides down your throat. You don't swallow. Great quote here. Nature will castigate those who don't masticate. <laughs> on the other end, there was an emphasis on excreta, right, which means human waste, particularly feed.